Thessalonians chapter 3. The title of this message this morning is Do Not Be Moved. Do not be moved. Paul was afraid that his church, his churches that he created, that started the ministry, but somehow they would be moved. There was just as many voices back then as there is today. False words, false messages, antichrists. And, and folks, understand this, that not, not all antichrist voices need to sound like they're devilish. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of antichrist voices voices even in the world today that sound very similar it's like counterfeit yep. you know now none of us here this morning we're not experts in counterfeit money and I don't think probably any of us would notice if we had a counterfeit $20 bill okay that's but but someone who is an expert in counterfeit could almost immediately recognize the phoniness the counterfeit of that bill. And so it is with us who are believers in Christ, especially those of us who preach the gospel of Christ, I can almost instantly sense that there's a counterfeit about that voice. It sounds good. It sounds appropriate. There's just enough of truth in that sound, in that voice, to draw one in, but at a closer look and a more acute hearing, there's something missing. Or there's something that's in there that really shouldn't be in there. And it is an antichrist voice. And if we're not acutely aware of that, we can find ourselves having been moved. That was Paul's greatest worry it wasn't that people would receive Christ his greatest worry wasn't that he could start more churches his greatest worry was that through some sort of affliction tribulation or antichrist voice that his churches would be moved and his instruction to all of them was do not be moved stay grounded Stay steady. Stay amen. firm. Stay in the doctrine. Stay in the truth. Can you say amen? Mm -hmm. And so that is our voice to us even here today. So we're going to pick that up. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Beginning with verse 1. Now first let me tell you. How this message came to be. Often people wonder. You know well, how does pastor get his message? You know, how does he, how does he get those? Well, let me tell you how I got this message. It just happened to be that the other day when Linda was having her surgery on Monday, she had her appendix out, had a, had a, uh, another procedure done before that. And she was spent almost five hours in recovery, which if you know anything about recovery after surgery, especially uh, appendix, appendix removal, that is way, way, way over the top. But the nurse that she had and some things that were taking place and her reaction to medication and pain medication and so forth was such that, that it required her to be in there for quite some time. So I think it was around 10.30, I finally was able to talk to one of the nurses because I couldn't go in recovery with her. And, and the nurse explained some of her difficulties and then said, it's, it's probably going to be a while. And I said, how What's a while? An hour, hour and a half, a couple hours? So she, she said, yeah, probably. I said, okay, all right. So I'm in the hospital, and if I leave, I can't come back. So I hang up the phone with her, and I, I notice it's about 10.30 or so, and I just think, now what am I gonna do? And as soon as I said, now what am I gonna do? The Lord spoke to me and said, get ready. Now, whenever God speaks to my heart and says, get ready, I know what that means. So I hurry up and ran over to the front desk and I said, ma'am, I need something to write with and a piece of paper, please. Uh, if you got something I can write with? She said, sure, here's a pen. And so I took the pen and she was looking around. I said, I'll just take that, that card thing right there. Just, you know, I'm kind of like in a hurry, right? Because it's starting to come and I don't have time to delay. 
And I said, I'll just take that card that, yeah, I'll write on that. Okay, here you go. So I went and I got up and found a corner of the hospital all by myself, sat down, and the Lord began to speak to me. And so here is this message from the Lord this morning. And uh, I trust it will bless your heart. There are many who, who need to hear this that maybe won't hear this, that need to hear it because of its effect upon our souls and our hearts. And so we begin with 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, Paul says, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. Verse 2. So we sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. In other words, Paul said, it's important that, that we know that there's a reassurance that, that they are right. It, he, Paul wanted to make sure that the church, the Thessalonian church, was rooted and grounded in that the message that Paul and his ministry team brought to them, that they were right. It was important that they understood that. And so he sent Timotheus there to establish them and to comfort them concerning their faith. Okay, now, let me say this. Please listen to this first assertion. You see, faith is fluid. Faith is fluid, which means many things can affect it if we don't guard it and protect our faith. Faith is fluid. We studied in Sunday school this morning where that the faith of the Israelites couldn't even last 40 days or 40 nights alone without their leader. In just a few days or maybe a week or two, however long it was, we don't know, the Bible doesn't indicate, but they lost faith in Moses as Moses was up on the top of the mountain getting the message from God, the Ten Commandments and instructions in the tabernacle and, and how these two to three million Israelites were supposed to to live their lives. And they lost faith. And so they impressed upon Aaron to build himself a golden calf. And that golden bull calf then was going to become their God and their deliverer. And their faith was like water. I mean, you took it and they just, and then, then they took a, a thing that you, that you stream things through and you know, you want to separate the spaghetti from the water that you cooked it in. So you pour the spaghetti and the water in and, and all the water filters out and the spaghetti stays there. Well, their faith was like all the water. They had no spaghetti. <laughs> and the water just went right through the strainer. And they were quickly moved from having faith in Jehovah who led them out of Egypt to now building a golden calf, an idol, that was God's first commandment to them when Moses was about to come off of the mountain. Please listen again to this assertion. Faith is fluid, which means many things can affect it if we don't guard it and protect our faith. Yeah. We've seen that in this pandemic. Many Christian people have stopped going to church because they stopped having church because we couldn't have church for a while. Did you hear just a few weeks ago, Governor Cuomo threatened New York, I will shut down all religious institutions immediately if they do not follow my orders. You know, and he was talking to the Jews and their tabernacles because they weren't wearing masks and, you know, practice social distancing. Cuomo, I will shut all the religious institutions down and there will be no more worship. Holy moly, is this not the United States of America? And the sad part about that is some people lose their faith because of that. Yeah. Some people stop going to church and they lose their faith because it's not rooted and grounded. And this was, this was Paul's greatest fear is that people would be moved understanding the notion that our faith is fluid. Now please listen to this next assertion. You see, Paul's faith was affected by their faith. Okay? Now, Paul's faith was affected 
by his church's faith. If the church in Thessalonica was doing well, which they were, and they were loving of one another, they were very kind and generous, and so Paul wanted to make sure that that, that continued. And because they were faithful in their service to God and the things of God, that built Paul's faith. The Corinthian church was the opposite. Oh my word. Sexual perversion was rampant in the Corinthian Greek church. For crying out loud. Ministers were meeting, you know, single women at the front door and taking them to a Sunday school class somewhere and doing things that come on. And Paul found out about this and understood it and he said, wait a minute. And his faith was burdened in his soul. And he said, I, do I have to come to you with a rod? Do I have to come into your church and beat you people? Because you have lost? You have so quickly been moved? He warned the Galatian church. The Galatian church, he created and they believed that salvation came through the faith in Jesus Christ. And then somebody came along and said, no, 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 no. You got to be circumcised to have faith. And so then some people in the Galatian church, they go, well, that, sounds, that sounds about the Jews. And the Galatian church said, that's right. That's right. If we got to be circumcised to have salvation, so do you. And the Gentiles are going, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We're not buying into your stuff. And then now there's a rift in the Galatian church. And Paul found out about it in his faith. Staggered, Paul's face staggered. He said, wait a minute. Have you so soon been removed from the truth? Who has beguiled you that you have been removed? That you've been moved out of place? And, and so the point is this, and that the Lord spoke to my soul the other day and wanted us to clearly understand that faith is fluid, which means your faith impacts my faith, and my faith impacts your faith. Maybe your lack of faith isn't going to get me to move and lose out with God. But your faith, your strong faith is going to encourage my faith and help me to rejoice and be more glad in the things of God because I know your faith is strong. And I hope my congregation and those people who listen to me on the internet, their faith is encouraged knowing that this preacher's faith is strong and secure and that I exhort you that your faith would be secure. And hopefully my faith will encourage your faith and together we'll be stronger than alone. Say amen. So faith here, Paul understands that faith is fluid. Now Paul's faith was affected by their faith. Now listen to this. This is to understand then. This is to understand the importance of church and fellowship within the church body. This is the reason the devil is trying to close church in America because the devil understands that our faith builds one another. Hence, the importance of coming to church. Hence, the value of having fellowship together. In two weeks, we're going to have a potluck after church service at our house. We're going to come together in fellowship. And we're going to be glad together. Yes. And we're going to eat our food. And we're going to break bread together. And we're going to watch the, the, I almost said the New England Patriots, but it's not them. It is the, uh, who does he play for now? Oh yeah, the Buccaneers. And we're going to watch the Buccaneers win. I mean, God is good, isn't he? <laughs> Hallelujah. See, I almost slipped there. It's tough to get used to after 20 years of saying the Patriots. Now you say the, um, the, um, the um, uh, who does he play for? Oh yeah, the Bucks. I'm being pretentious, you know that, yes? This is the reason the devil is trying to close church in America. Because he understands his strength. And he also understands that Jesus Christ is just about to come back for his bride. Amen. Which is the true believers in Christ Jesus. And he's coming back for a strong solid, firm, alert, always aware, and paying attention to the signs of the times. He's coming back for a church and a body 
who looks up and rejoices in the soon coming sense of our Redeemer. That's who he's coming back for. Not some mealy mally, you know, wimpy, crying, feeling sorry for themselves, wallowing in their own self misery. That's not who Christ is coming back for. He's coming back for those of us that are solid upon the rock of Christ Jesus. Say amen. Wow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, the main weapon, listen to this now, the main weapon of the devil, the main weapon of our enemy is to get a person to question God. That started in the garden. The serpent came to Eve and they were having a conversation. And then Serpent said, oh, isn't this a beautiful garden? Look at all these beautiful trees and these beautiful fruit trees. And Eve, in her gorgeous, adorning birthday suit, said, oh, yes, isn't it beautiful? It's all so lovely. And then the serpent said, but isn't there like a tree in the garden here that God, you know? And Eve said, oh, yes, it's that tree right over there. God said, do not partake of that tree lest we be cursed. And then the serpent questioned God in Eve's mind. And he said, hath God said? Hath God said? You see, folks, the first and main trick of the enemy is to get someone to question God. Let me declare this. God is not to be questioned. You can question the principal. You can question the athletic director. You might even get away with questioning the coach from time to time. Never question the preacher. <laughs> and by all means, you never question God. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I hope that face came through. That was one of my better ones. It was one of my better faces. Hallelujah. You see, the main weapon of the devil is to get people to question God. You see, this was the Jews' greatest mistake. Now let me ask this question. Think real hard. Don't answer it out loud, but think about it. And this is a tough question. In fact, this is one of the toughest questions I've ever asked. Is there a difference between missing the mark and making a mistake? So as I was in the presence of the Lord this last week, the Lord was speaking to my heart concerning this question message it came to me is there a difference between missing the mark and making a mistake and I gotta honestly tell you about for the next 30 minutes while I was in the presence of the Lord I couldn't answer that and each time I thought of a scenario of making a mistake some of that same scenario had parts of it that was equal to missing the mark in fact, then I even began to do some research and I got on my phone and, and I did some research about different things and, and I spent almost a half an hour and, and I wasn't coming up with answers. I wasn't coming up with an answer. What's, is there a difference between missing the mark and making a mistake? And so finally, after doing all my research, I thought, well, let me just ask God. You know, that's not a bad thing to do. You know, mm -hmm. when you've tried everything else, ask God. So. I said, Lord, you've got to show me. I don't know. I don't know what this means. And the Lord spoke this to my heart. And he said, to understand the difference is to compare the final days of John the Baptist and Judas Iscariot. To understand the difference between missing the mark and making a mistake is to reflect on the last moments of the life of John the Baptist and Judas Iscariot. And instantly when the Lord spoke that to my soul, I instantly understood. You see, John the Baptist missed the mark. He first said, Behold, the Lamb of God, to whose sandals I am unworthy to lace. Jesus and John the Baptist were cousins and they grew up together. 
And then Christ presented himself as the Messiah. And John the Baptist knew that. And he baptized him. And everyone there saw as Jesus came out of the water as a symbol of his death and resurrection. And a dove landed upon his head, and a voice of heaven cried out and said, Behold my son, to whom I am well pleased. That's cool. Now Christ is on the scene, and he begins to preach the living manifestation of his Father in heaven. You see, we know and we understand that now John the Baptist needed to go. Just like Joseph, his father, Joseph had to die now, and that lineage had to stop from Jesse. Because the importance of Jesse's lineage, David, was that was born, going to be born a savior of all of mankind. And once Christ, that savior, was born, that lineage now needed to stop. There was no more lineage from Jesse. And now that Christ is upon the scene, and he's going to be preaching about himself and his father, John the Baptist now would just get in the way, and so it was time for John the Baptist's life to be done. So he got arrested, thrown in prison, and we know the story. Just before he was beheaded, he told his disciples, he said, he just couldn't understand. Hey, wait a minute. Jesus of Nazareth, you got to be setting me free. Dude, you can raise Lazarus from the dead. You can heal the sick and make the blind to see. you got to get me out of prison or they're going to cut my head off. And so he sent his disciples to Christ and he missed the mark when he said this. Ask the Lord, are you the one that we're to be waiting for or should we look for another? Oh. I don't know whether John the Baptist is in heaven or not in heaven. I think he's in heaven. I just think John the Baptist missed the mark because he got too wrapped up, and I'm going to get to this in just a moment. He got too wrapped up in his earthly condition. And because of that, he missed the mark. Judas, on the other hand, made the greatest of all mistakes. And he betrayed Christ. He was a thief. He took money. To betray his Lord. He kissed him on the cheek. And they took him. And Judas understanding. The great mistake that he made. Tried to give the money back to the Pharisees. And they said to him. Go do what seems to be proper for you to do. And Christ before that. Said to whomever. Dips. Into the cup with me. Had been best. They never been born. You see, John the Baptist missed the mark, but I believe he was saved. Judas Iscariot made the greatest of all mistakes and burns in hell today. You see, folks, that's the difference between missing the mark and making a mistake. And the Jews made the greatest of all mistakes. And when Christ hung on the cross, they said, crucify him, crucify him. Let his blood be upon us and upon our children and our children's children. And to this day, even though they're the children of God, they're accursed people. Still suffering abominable, abominable hatred upon their people. And when Jesus Christ returns and takes his church to be to heaven, all of hell is going to be broken loose. And those Jews that are left remaining upon the earth, through the tribulation period, it's going to be all about them. Because they made the greatest of all mistakes. But you know what, folks? Maybe you and I, at different times, we've missed the mark. And i got to tell you, I'm not standing here before you claiming to be perfect by any means. I've missed the mark. But grace and mercy reign supreme. And I'm expecting to meet my Lord and Savior amen. in the air. Can you say amen? amen. You see, that's the difference between missing the mark and making a mistake. Let's read verse 3 now in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 as I get ready to close. So then Paul said to the people, 
He said that no man should be moved by these afflictions. And then he says, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. You see, Paul said, we're appointed to have these afflictions. The fact that we're going through tribulation and sickness and health, and, and the fact that we're appointed unto these things, do not let that move your faith. Your faith must not lie in our earthly conditions, but your faith must lie in the speaking of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's where our faith lies. Not in our earthly conditions. And that's what Paul is trying to get through to them. Listen to this. Note that no man should be moved by these afflictions. You see, to question God could cause a person to be moved. To doubt God will cause a person to fall and lose out with God. You see, to question God could cause a person to fall. But to doubt God. You see, we all get to a place where we question God in our earthly conditions. And that is what this message is really all about today. You see, Paul was saying to the Thessalonian church, don't let my earthly condition of affliction, don't let it move your faith. Your faith isn't in my earthly conditions. Your faith is in the truth of the gospel that I've declared unto you. And if my, that faith that I've declared unto you be rich even in my condition of affliction, then let your faith be even stronger and more rooted and grounded. That's what Paul is saying to the Thessalonian church. And that's what Paul is saying to you and I here today. Listen to this now quickly as I begin to close. You know how many people I know aren't going to listen, hear this message today that need to hear what I'm just about to say. You see, many people miss the mark because they question the motives of God in their earthly conditions. God spoke this into my soul just a few days ago. He said, many people miss the mark because they question the motives of God in their earthly conditions. And I gotta tell you, I've done that. God, this, this isn't fair. This is, I've done nothing to deserve this, oh God. This isn't fair. It's just not fair. And like I told the Sunday school class this morning, then I get in an argument with God about bearing fruit. And then me and God, we argue back and forth about bearing fruit. And you can't ever argue with God because he's always going to win the argument. <laughs> he just always is. And he won that argument again. And so then I say, Lord, and I apologize for my question, the motives of God, and then I worship Him and I praise Him. You see, people, we vacillate back and forth. I vacillate from being in the flesh and then being in the Spirit. When I'm in the Spirit, there's no questioning at all. But if I spend too much time in the flesh, then I question the motives of God in my earthly conditions. And that's not where I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be in the Spirit. Can you say amen? And you see, many people miss the mark because they question the motives of God in their earthly conditions. You see, this is placing too much of our affections on earthly things and not enough on heavenly things. And Christian people today are putting too much, they're investing too much of their affections into their earthly conditions and not investing enough of their affections into earth, to heavenly things where Christ dwells. Amen. And because they invest so much of their affections into their earthly conditions, they're being crushed. They're literally being crushed by their earthly conditions. And they weep and they cry and they even try to cry out to God and they maybe even receive a little bit of help and maybe even a little bit of counsel, but because their affections are still too much invested in earthly conditions, they're crushed. They're being crushed. 
I know what it's like to be crushed. And I tell you what, it's far better to be out from underneath that crushing than it is to be crushed by earthly conditions. If you're going to be crushed, let it be crushed by the hand of God and not by my affections being too allegiant to the things of this earth. We're not meant for the things of this earth. Can you say amen? Listen to this now as I close. To prosper in treasures in heaven is to understand the difference between both. To prosper in treasures in heaven, and that's what my the rest of my life is, is, is committed to, is to prosper in the treasures of heaven. Because earthly things, earthly accomplishments are done. They're just, they're just about over. So now it's time to get on with building our kingdom in heaven. And to understand the difference between both. To prosper in treasures in heaven is to understand the difference between both. And understand this now as I close. The distribution of our affections is a personal choice. It's a personal choice. I will choose to show my affections and to invest however much of my affection to earthly things. And I will choose to invest my affections into the things of God. That is a personal choice. The distribution of our affections is a personal choice. It's time to get choosing the right affection. Amen. Amen. It's time to get choosing that our affections are upon things of God and not upon things of this earth. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 I close with this. And so then I asked God, I said, okay, God, how can I increase my affections for heavenly things? That's what I did. I said, okay, God, how can I increase my affection for heavenly things? And this was his answer. He said, amplify your gifts. <laughs> amplify your gifts. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to amplify our gifts. That means when we come to church, hallelujah, let the presence of God fall on us. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Let's all stand. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, I just pray now, Lord, as we go our separate ways, hallelujah, God, do we go with a Christ-like affection for the things of God. That we go with a fresh hunger for the things of God. And let these things of earth grow strangely dim, strangely dim, as we hunger for the kingdom and the things of heaven. As we hunger for the mighty, powerful things of God. Let none of us this morning but have heard this message today. Ever be moved until the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Bless this congregation. I pray, Lord, in health. Bless them, Lord, in relationships. Bless them, Lord, in finances. Bless them in all the works of their hands. May this congregation be blessed for their faithfulness to have been in the presence of God this morning. And for that, we give you all praise and glory. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. And everyone said amen. Wow. Pastor Chuck.